Welcome everyone to this important topic of COVID-19 and the university's response. Um, and um, you'll note, I think, if you've looked at our website, that this is CG seminar or webinar number 298. And we have Richard Watermeyer from University of Bristol to help us inch closer to the magic milestone of 300 seminars. Um, before I introduce Richard, let me take you through the webinar protocols. Remember, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted online on the CG website fairly soon. Uh, and that will take you into our YouTube channel and you'll be able to see all of our, um, our webinars there. Transcript of the chat function will also be posted. That will be accessed through our website. Now, please keep yourself muted while we're in session, uh, and unless you're coming into the discussion in the Q&A part after Richard has given his initial, uh, initial presentation. Um, and there's no need to have your video on either, you know, during the presentation part of the, of the webinar, but, you know, as with the audio, it's a very good idea to turn it on when you come into the discussion. We recommend you that you use speaker view during the webinar so you can more clearly see who is talking. To ask a question, uh, to make a statement in response to the presentation, use the chat function. Develop your question or your statement there, and I will um, then select people into the Q and A discussion part on the basis of what's coming through in the chat. Let me warn you that uh, if you come in late, as we had a, we had a couple of very good questions on Tuesday, which came in late and we couldn't include them in the, in the webinar. Um, so it's important to, to keep that in mind, develop your statement of your question before about quarter to um, three o'clock UK time, you're almost certainly going to get in. Um, when you're invited to ask your question and I'll give you a, a little warning in the chat before I ask you in, um, please unmute yourself, most important, switch on your video if you can, and state your name and where you are from and then launch into your question or your statement. Uh, now, it's a great pleasure to introduce Richard Watermeyer, one of the leading researchers of higher education in the world and someone who's done a particularly large amount of work on COVID-19 and the universities. And, and as uh, I think a, a matchless data set, which we're all be starting to mine quite a lot. Richard is the um, professor of higher education and co-director of the Centre for Higher Education Transformations at the University of Bristol. Uh, he's a, a sociologist by training and um, in terms of his current work, um, he's got particular interest in academic praxis, institutional and research governance, uh, scientific accountability and engagement and higher education policy reform. Recent books include Competitive Accountability in Academic Life, uh, the impact of gender controversies, consequences and challenges. Um, over the last two years, much of Richard's work has been focused on the transformational implications of the pandemic for university communities around the world. Um, we look forward to your presentation today, Richard. Thanks ever so much, Simon. And I'm gonna now attempt to share screen. Yeah, Hopefully we can see that, that's good. That's good, excellent, off we go. Uh, thanks ever so much for the invitation. Delighted to be with you all today. Uh, and I'm going to be talking uh, all about what we've been calling pandemia, uh, a wonderful neologism uh, that, that really describes the experience of, uh, of the, that we've had within the academy over the course of the last couple of years in response to the pandemic. Or rather, should we say, the experience of institutional responses to the pandemic. And I think that's quite an, an important uh, uh, qualification. Uh, but through the presentation, I'll be chiefly looking at a, a variety of different survey data uh, that talks to how university staff more broadly, so academics and those in the professional services arms of universities, mainly within the UK, but also uh, be looking across comparatively across uh, other international contexts, have found uh, the pandemic impact uh, through, the through their institution's response and the impact of that upon their personal and professional lives. So, uh, well, as you might imagine, the, the research itself kicked off pretty much as uh, lockdown gripped us in the UK, and a bunch of colleagues and I uh, started discussing what we immediately with, were seeing as the impact 
impact of institutional responses to the pandemic as campuses quickly began to close and we saw rapid emergency transition to remote and online forms of working. We kicked off initially with a, a survey uh, that was international in focus, but um, was mainly drew upon UK academics experiences of how they were responding to this rapid transition. That's the first part of the talk. I'm then gonna move on to a second survey, which looked specifically at how the institutional response to the pandemic was impacting academics' mental health. Again, international in its focus, but I'll mainly concentrate on the UK data set, which was the, 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 the most abundant. Uh, and then I'm also gonna talk about how professional services staff, let's not forget as a significant um, segment of the university community, how they themselves were impacted by their institutional responses to the pandemic. So in total, I'm gonna to be talking across a data set that, that ranges across about 7,000 odd UK higher education workers and significant number in addition uh, that represent a wider international higher education community. And outside of the UK, there are three country points of interest, uh, South Africa, Australia, and Ireland, uh, as representative of, of slightly different higher education sectors, as a representative of countries that pursued a slightly different response, certainly earlier on, in terms of country level handling and governmental handling of the pandemic. Uh, uh, and uh, to identify, and also actually I should say mention in, in the context of infrastructure, particularly as relates to the South African context, where we see something of the differential experience between Global North and Global South. Uh, and here are just a few of the publications that we've so far produced as a consequence of the study. So I'm gonna begin with, with how academic staff and our initial survey, so this is, goes back to right at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, how uh, academics were experiencing and perceived this transition to remote forms of working. And I do this as part of a kind of a kind of historical development and evolution of the experience of the pandemic as we've experienced it. And also in some way as, as a means to think about a conceptualization of long COVID. Long COVID, not just in its cl clinically uh, clinical form, but also in the experience of a pandemic which is ongoing and for the, which the impacts of which are even further ongoing. Okay. So let's look at some of the immediate perspectives on transitioning to remote working. So, and again, I'm mainly gonna focus here on the UK based data, this went further and there was about 3000 academic responses to, to the survey. I'm gonna focus mainly on the UK data uh, of which there was just over a thousand responses uh, as you might anticipate given the, the differential size across the, um, the uh, nations of the UK. In terms of the sector size, the majority of respondents came from England. A majority uh, of female respondents uh, and uh, the employment status thing is something that's quite interesting, particularly as so much of what was talked about by respondents uh, was on, on the, in the terms of precarity and uh, uh, increased casualization and, and risk to academic careers. Uh, and interesting to see there that we had mostly full-time uh, people in full-time contracts, but also open-ended contracts. So these were a majority of the people on, on relatively secure forms of academic employment. So I think that's worth stating right from the outset. Uh, now, very, I'm going to quickly whiz through some of these because these are, I think, are, these are more contextual in the context that we're now two years on. But what we initially saw was uh, just about a teeny weeny majority of our UK based respondents saying that they felt underprepared in terms of their delivery of online learning, teaching and assessment, which I'm, I'm going to abbreviate to LTA. Um, there was a general sense of confidence in LTA uh, online institutional support. Majority of respondents there, 72 percent felt that they were their institutions had been relatively supportive in the initial transition to online LTA. And similarly, a majority of people felt that they had access to appropriate technologies that would support their online LTA. Okay, um, when we look at this across a disciplinary context, it's kind of interesting. We see that um, the highest proportion of preparedness, confidence, support and access, according to discipline, well, surprise, surprise, there's computer science, which you might anticipate but also the social sciences and educational uh, researchers. So these are, these are uh, as, as um, differentiated by our respondents by their disciplinary affiliation. So we, we see variation there in terms of the level of preparedness, confidence, support and access uh, at disciplinary levels. Uh, 
with those social sciences uh, uh, first among the top. Themes from the open text responses, and some of this was published in a piece that we had uh, that came out in Nature. Bear with me. As I shuffle across, here we go. So some of the major things, and bearing in mind again, this is early doors in the, the, the pandemic stage, we get destabilization of student, student marketplace and what that was meaning for universities. And we saw some of the initial kind of actions from universities in terms of uh, non-continuation of fixed term contracts uh, and as universities really tried to shore up finances and ensure long-term solvency and short-term solvency, especially where there were major concerns in terms of an international student marketplace issues of recruitment and retention of students. Plus, at the same time, we saw significant uh, um, activity from a private uh, ed tech sector, uh, which continues. One only needs to look at data produced by the likes of Holon IQ to see huge ca international uh, uh, capital investment and venture capital investment in ed tech, with some suggesting that the rise of private ed tech uh, in the context of online education, specifically in a in what some refer to as this kind of milieu of pandemics uh, being a significant challenger uh, to universities and actually a destabilizer to universities in terms of thinking through not only the value chain of, of higher education, but also the monopolization of higher education provision by universities. Okay. Obviously, there were concerns, major concerns voiced by academics related to this in terms of the economic impact, uh, not only in terms of what was being feared, if there was a drop off in terms of student numbers, but what that would also mean in terms of other sources of revenue generated through the university other than by tuition fees. And how it would also impact, of course, local economies and national GDP, where there was a shortfall of the kinds of numbers and footfall into the country. Okay, all evident there and all well known. Skip along. Now we now we get into uh, some of the kind of territory of the well kind of known critique, which we've had chapter and verse for years and years with regards to the kind of neoliberal discourse of higher education and, and its critique. We see more in terms here of the of fears regarding the deprofessionalization and dumbing down, much of which occurs within a critical uh, techn critical literature around ed tech and technology of higher education. We see more concerns here with regards to precarization and jobs obsolescence with the role of increased technology and particularly automation and artificial intelligence type strands coming through. So, so really interesting that a lot of these kind of initial fears about the pandemic were also accelerated by uh, what, what have been for quite a while concerns about the role of technology, uh, digital disruption, especially in terms of how higher education is organized and what this means in the context of academic labor in, a, in, in the pedagogical sense. Uh, and job cuts, which obviously we, we saw at an, at an early stage as universities attempted to shore up finances. Uh, now here's a, here's a theme that we've seen throughout and which other colleagues have done work on in terms of work intensification, but also the unequal distribution of work intensification, particularly by gender, where we saw uh, closing of campuses, closing of schools especially, and an even uh, distribution of uh, labor uh, as affecting certainly women who were seen to carry the brunt of both of child caring and other forms of domestic responsibilities, uh, but also the pastoral uh, responsibilities and an uneven share of that, which has been well documented in the literature. So we see work intensification, gender inequalities, and also more general forms of inequalities seem to be coming through. Okay. Uh, we also get concerns of cessation of research, although this is quite an uneven picture, because whilst we see in some quarters a reprioritize or rather a prioritization, significant emphasizing on institutions towards teaching, and in some institutions, basically a sense of it's uh, a, 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 an entire pause on all research activity. Again, the experience of this is massively uneven, dependent upon institutional type. Uh, and uh, for that matter, again, issues of gender. So we see significant imbalance in terms of senior and male uh, uh, academics versus perhaps more junior or middle career academics. We also see this general sense of what this means in terms of an impact on an academic labor market, where research itself is, is seen to uh, further dwindle, especially for those unable to make the jump to uh, online forms of uh, research undertaking. Uh, and what that means in terms of uh, those seeking employment for the first time, or also crucially seeking promotion on the basis that research 
which is the major currency of both. Um, and finally, worth saying, and no, perhaps no great surprise here, that there was an, an initial limited identification with digital affordances, something that we would see would change during the course of the pandemic as we became more accustomed to the use mainly of uh, video conferencing type technologies. In fact, most of the technology we've been using, many would, would classify as kind of education 2.0, relatively uh, basic. We're not yet quite in the area of AR or VR type use of technology, but there we go. But those initial identifications were limited in terms of the affordances were limited. Okay, now I'm going to turn to the second survey, which focuses on uh, the impact of the pandemic on wealth, fair health, and well-being. And there was a special interest here because we ourselves were beginning to identify the significant strain that was being placed on academics, and which was exhibiting itself. And I'm sure many of you would have felt that in terms of the, the conversations with colleagues, the need to better support colleagues. And there's aspects of that which we'll, uh, be, we'll get into shortly in terms of the, the benefits, perhaps, of the pandemic. Anyway, second survey comes through and uh, we get a similar decent return in terms of numbers. Um, there's just under, so about 2,649 academics are surveyed in total, again, international. Again, the focus here is going to be on the UK. As before, a significantly higher number of respondents were female. Uh, we get a lower number of people on open-ended, or what we might think of as more secure contracts, and a majority of individuals from what we would think of as research-intensive institutions. Key themes that came through... Uh, a concern around crisis management and return of leadership towards crisis management, which was providing a foil uh, for the creep of undemocratic forms of institutional governance, non-consultative non forms of governance, what some referred to as gold command, quite autocratic methods of governance, that was allowing certain cost-cutting initiatives to uh, go through quite legitimately or under the guise of legitimate uh, leadership. Um, and all of this is a part of a kind of a discourse of crisis management or disaster management, if you like. What others have spoken about and what we talked about uh, in our own writing of this, we compared to some of the work of Naomi Klein in thinking around issues of disaster capitalism and the benefits and attributes to be gained by universities from uh, uh, adopting this form of, of overall management. Again, we see writ large this concern around deprioritization of research by many institutions as they seek to focus on major income generation activities. Um, we see a continuation of a theme in terms of impaired trust in university leadership, partly because of this increasing centralization of power within universities, the proliferation of non-consultative forms of governance in universities. We see increasing concerns with regards to labor casualization, job insecurities, uh, we also see as a consequence of the increasing precarity a rise attributed to many of our respondents in terms of accounts of work exploitation um, and individuals feeling that they have to go not only beyond the bar of what they would normally do, but be uh, susceptible, willingly susceptible uh, to forms of work exploitation just on the basis of uh, job retention and a further continuation of concerns around work-based inequalities. When we look at some of the kind of statistical data from the data set, we see uh, a concern that they, and, and bearing in mind again, that framing of this is about the institutional response to, pandem to, to the pandemic rather than a general response to pandemic, that we see this kind of corporate level response or, or the response of university stylized as a corporate response of contributing to work-related stress. We see significant numbers of respondents talking around digital fatigue, that sense of always being on and online and on call online. Uh, major concerns around being demotivation, again, attributed to, to burnout. Major concern with regards to the damage to which the pandemic and institutional responses to the pandemic were causing into the future career pathways of early career academics. Um, not least again in consideration of uh, drawbacks to and uh, uh, um, interruptions to doctoral level study to postdoctoral study and the general cessation in many quarters of, of research um, and changes uh, long-term changes so what many at this stage uh, were, were seeing as the long-term changes to academic lives as a consequence of institutional responses to covid and those long-term impacts having themselves major impact upon academics own health and well-being. Okay. 
Now, if we look across this and across four country contexts, and uh, as a reminder, as the flags illustrate, we did this across uh, Ireland, the UK, South Africa, and Australia as three countries, as I've described previously, as an interesting kind of sample comparison. We see a repeat and we see consensus and we see uniformity in terms of the appearance of these same, these same kind of concerns from our respondents. And these were kind of worth saying, of course, these were we, we had to do four country level. We did four country edition uh, surveys to uh, accommodate for different types of languaging um, uh, uh, and, and uh, for the nuances of different higher education sectors. Anyway, we see continuing concerns around work intensification as a consequence of the pandemic, job precarity and scarcity, erosion of trust and leadership, deterioration of mental health. An exacerbation of existing inequalities. Okay, if we look specifically and we hone in on Australia and the Australian survey data, we see some interesting stuff specifically as relates to the involvement or rather the non-involvement of government and a sense generally of government apathy towards sustaining a university workforce. Uh, we see, sorry, let me just move that. We see uh, uh, a sense of increasing corporatization of the sector and universities having having responded through increased marketization. So in other words, because of the invisibility of government, because of the, the non-support of government, the apathy of government, there's an increasing push towards corporatization to ensure that universities themselves remain on an even keel. And of course, we've seen a lot of that in the context of uh, significant retrenchment and uh, increased precarity uh, within the Australian higher education context. And finally, uh, a major push here in terms of saying, where are our leaders? Where are our university leaders in this? And the need for university leaders to acknowledge and to directly address the challenges that are produced by uh, from the impact of COVID-19 on terms of staff, in terms of their stress, digital fatigue, negative impacts on work-life balance, and the longer term changes to the academic work in the sector. So a real emphasis coming through here in terms of the absence of government and essentially the absence of strong university leadership in response to government, but also in response to internal higher education communities. On the plus side, there are some pluses, it's not all doom and gloom. We see uh, respondents articulated positive aspects in respect of a transition to remote working. And some of these will be familiar to all of us in the context of uh, less travel as a consequence of, of lower, lower need for commuting, conferences going online, uh, uh, much more kind of teleworking, uh, and the contrib actual contribution of that in, in ways to work-life balance. Uh, we also see a prospect of increased autonomy. So why are we seeing a return to autonomy of, of staff as a consequence of the opportunity for remote working? So less of the kind of... Uh, uh, on-campus uh, presenteeism uh, and being chained to the desk type scenario there. Okay, when we look to Ireland, we see a, a sense that, okay, well, yeah, we, we've got COVID, the pandemic is seriously disrupting things, but but it's not the core problem. In fact, what this has done in, in terms of what the impact of COVID actually has been for Irish academics, it's kind of further illuminating and casting of more the spotlight in terms of what's going wrong within the Irish higher education setup. So we see uh, a sense that the pandemic is just a part of a crisis trajectory that has been going on since the uh, global economic uh, crash of 2008, or 2000, since post-2009. We get concerns of how the pandemic is just another uh, a manifestation of the issues uh, related to neoliberal logics, intensified managerialism, and of course, intensified managerialism also uh, being a part of institutional responses to the pandemic. We get same accounts here in terms of related stress, digital fatigue, work-life balances issues and, and the like. We also get more of concerns from Irish academics in terms of the contraction of job and career opportunities in academia. Uh, and uh, a sense again of this, this, this sense of neglect, that we've neglected staff, staff welfare, health and well-being. Um, and, and that the pandemic has really brought the, the, the neglect of, of a kind of human centric model of leadership and ethics of care has been brought and the absence of an ethics of care has been brought into even starker relief. And what we really need here is a, the prioritization of a human centric model uh, of productivity and academic labor that stresses perhaps less an emphasis on continuous, you know, tailorous production line of positional uh, outputs and, and positional gains and instead takes a much more human centric, empathetic, compassionate look at how we do what we do. 
Um, again, we do see, however, some positives here in terms in the Irish context where a pivot to online delivery uh, was seen as to provide a platform for greater experimentation with digital forms of pedagogy and uh, the beginnings here of an identification with what some of this could do in terms of both ameliorating uh, uh, pedagogy, uh, but more generally uh, uh, academic practice. Okay, let's turn to South Africa. And before we turn to South Africa and full in some of the data, it's just worth providing a little bit of context here um, in terms of thinking about the higher education sector in South Africa and South Africa more generally as a country. So it's, more, it's generally acknowledged as the most unequal country on earth. There we go. Uh, over 80% of South Africa's population is either in either severe poverty or struggling with food poverty. There are connectivity and access, and access to technology for teaching and learning is massively challenging. Although interestingly, there's data that supports the use of 36 million people in the country having, having use of, not necessarily ownership, but use of mobile phones. Teaching online in South Africa uh, tends therefore to mean, if it's online, means that it, it refers to teaching through and with mobile phones. So far from ideal, rather than tablets or personal computers and devices, which we're large has largely been the route to our, our teaching in a, in, a, in a global north context and uh, as many of us will know from working with colleagues in South Africa and the frequent number of times that zoom connections drop off electricity supply is not guaranteed and South Africa does have a failing power grid with uh, outages that can last for up to six hours a day so what we get when we look at the South African survey data set is again more of this sense of we are invisible, no one's listening to us, no one's talking to us, we're suffering neglect. We get a sense of, as in the other country context, increased workplace inequality. Again, we get this further intensification of managerialism. We get deteriorating prospects for early career academics, no great surprise there. We get institutional legitimization of cost cutting initiatives contributing to labor exploitation. So more in terms of the sense of this uh, crisis management affording a window of opportunity to legitimately uh, downsize and enforce retrenchment exercises. Um, and then again, we get some really interesting stuff going on, of course, in, in the context of South Africa's historical, uh, uh, the, the historical context of South Africa and South African higher education. Uh, and the sense that there is a, a tension here between the use of technology as some kind of panacea, uh, as, as some kind of means of, of continuity, uh, and actually a sense that it could be used to, to kind of reinforce many of the issues around colonialism, of apartheid, uh, and a failure to connect the opportunities through, di through uh, digital technology to indigenous knowledge. So some real interesting issues there in terms of epistemic injustice. However, Okay, and this is where it's, we get more of the same kind of thing of this, this sense of increased community. And I think we, we all experienced this during the pandemic, more positive caring relationships were reported between colleagues. Uh, and this leads us to this concept that many of you probably will be familiar with of Ubuntu, uh, which came through strongly from the South African data and was actually directly related to, which was this sense of bon, what I would think of as bonhomie, you know, uh, uh, the, the camaraderie, the bonhomie that emerges during a time of crisis, the pulling together. But this bonhomie, this Ubuntu, a sense of collective well-being, actually also being a prompt scaffolding individual and collective resilience and well-being. Uh, so we see really emerging through this in the South African context and Ubuntu being a, a cornerstone of kind of uh, the kind of South African philosophy in terms of thinking about well-being uh, as collective well-being as opposed to over individual well-being um, that we see this uh, uh, emphasizing of an ethics of care. Okay, and uh, I'm just keeping an eye. I don't know how I'm doing on time. I don't have my watch here. So I'm just going to go as quickly as I can through this, because I think this is another important aspect of it. So if we've got some of these kind of international dimensions, we've got this whole community dimension as well. So it's not just about the academics. I must say we didn't we don't we didn't do anything with the students, but we did target and look at the experiences of professional services staff within universities. Um, so this, again, is purely UK based data. Uh, and we surveyed close to 5000 professional service staff working across UK universities. Again, we see a majority of female participants in this case it was about 71%. Again, most of these were full time. The majority again were working in pre 1992, so older uh, universities. Uh, we see if we look across the kind of branches of professional services, of course, of which there are many within a UK university context, 
we see the majority of our respondents uh, being more kind of um, facing, uh, student and staff facing directly. So we've got learning and teaching and academic support, PSS, and we've got student support, PSS, as two of the most represented uh, branches within the survey data. Okay, so when we consider the impact on workability and work productivity, so this was a major part of the survey, and I should say that this was uh, this survey was launched. Uh, I'm trying to remember now, last year. So this is a step on. So we've got a, the third step on in terms of this this narrative of the experiences of of the pandemic. So it's a, at a point where most people are now quite acclimatized and accustomed, become cultured to working remotely from using a variety of online platforms to undertake their work. So it's important to get that uh, uh, time dimension and contextualization to it. Um, okay, so if we're looking towards, and this was kind of summer of last year, where are PSS thinking in terms of how uh, the pandemic or the institutional response to the pandemic has, has impacted their job? Um, and of course, this is mainly in, re with, with in, re in respect of remote working. So we see uh, just over 50% here of individuals of our, of our close to 5,000 samples saying, you know what, working from home made no difference uh, to my ability to do my job. Um, what we do see is actually just under 50% of our uh, samples saying that working from home has actually increased productivity or has at least made them more productive in terms of their work. Then if we move on to further data, we look at the impact on mental and physical health and well-being. Yeah, well, this is interesting. So while, while where we might see increased productivity, what we also see is negative impact associated with both mental and physical health. So over 54%, just over 54% of our respondents claiming that there was a negative impact on their mental health, 50% claiming impact on their physical health. Although kind of curiously, and though obviously much smaller in terms of numbers, what we also see, and I'm still to get my head around this, is 24% claiming uh, uh, impact, positive impact on physical health and 20% on mental health. Again, there, there are ways in which we can explain that and can be explained through increased flexibilization of academic labor uh, uh, and non-commuting, things like that, which we can get into. Okay. So this was a particularly interesting finding. So where we where we mainly found, and I didn't really go into it because I didn't, there's not sufficient space of time to talk about the leadership dimensions in, in great detail. But 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 while our academic cohorts in both survey one and survey two and internationally were pretty much damning of uh, higher education, uni sorry, university senior leadership, what we found amongst professional service staff was a bit different. In fact, we found that over 60% of our sample described the uh, performance of senior leadership through the pandemic to be one of competence, with actually a quarter of all uh, survey respondents saying that their university leadership's handling of uh, the pandemic as being extremely competent. Okay, uh, some interesting stuff here, which I think is especially pertinent as we uh, uh, enter this kind of period, certainly in the UK, uh, of post-COVID recovery. Uh, in terms of the reorganization of non-academic labor uh, within universities and thinking, of course, that PSS have always traditionally uh, never had the same privileges about us, us as academics in terms of being able to work uh, remotely or more flexibly. We see 71% uh, of the close to 5,000 sample uh, saying that what they want to see is a blended form, form of future work. So we're getting into this kind of territory of high flex work. Uh, we see very few uh, indeed, talking about an exclusive uh, return to campus, but but even fewer, interestingly, talking about, sorry, uh, uh, I'm just, yeah, uh, the fewest number there, sorry, uh, other than the other category seeking an exclusively campus-based, but also uh, similarly small percentage there in terms of being exclusively home-based. So a real sense there that there's uh, an, a need to embrace high flex working. And there's a whole paper that's coming out on this, which discusses the reasons for that in fuller detail. So let's look at this in overview. Uh, and we've got this sense of fracture here, have we not? That's attributed to the pandemic, but also the pandemic as a consolidator, uh, bringing into stark relief many of the problems that have existed for quite some time. So no great surprise here. We had a hyper-competitive academic labour market that pre-existed the pandemic that has been further intensified. We've got a surplus of doctoral talent that has been produced with uh, a, a, a poverty of jobs. We have increase 
in terms of staff precarization and labor casualization within universities. Again, these are themes and the trope that is pre-pandemic but have been further accelerated by the pandemic. We get concerns here around workforce inequality, uh, certainly in terms of gender pathways, ceilings, unequal burden that's encountered uh, by different types of staff according to their social profile. The mental health crisis, which has been uh, in existence well before the pandemic, has, has been further exacerbated by the pandemic. We've also got major concerns on a clinical level with regards to long COVID. How do we handle this in institutional contexts? And there being some degree of stigma attached to that. Uh, we're obviously seeing, as just has been reported only uh, this morning, uh, more widely concerns around mental health of students uh, and in issues around loneliness, anxiety and depression. We've got a continuation of this theme of a breakdown. Have we got an actual break, can total breakdown of trust, perhaps, accentuated by what we're referring to here conceptually as pandemia and uh, the turn towards crisis management? So an even greater, more exaggerated move from consultative democratic forms of governance within institutions to kind of gold command forms of leadership. We've got the challenge now of blended working. Uh, blended hybridized pedagogy. How do we begin to negotiate and mediate these? We've got a hostile policy environment, which I think has been particularly illustrated well in the Australian context, but is also well in, in, evidenced in the UK. We've got concerns of sector contraction and increased stratification, and the increased stratification particularly is attributed to um, uh, EdTech, which I'm going to come on to very briefly in a moment. We've also got issues here with regards to workforce attrition. We've got diaspora of UK academics to other international settings, uh, a continuation in part as a, as a trend caused by Brexit. And we've got an overall state of uh, fading allure as, as attributed to UK academia especially. And then we've got this set against a few things. We've got this overall continuation of, of the prestige economy, which has always been there but it's perhaps even more prominent now and dominated by what I've previously referred to as, as a system or a, yeah, a system of competitive accountability, where what universities do is a perpetual hunt for positional goods that uh, confirm their positionality within performance league tables, their, uh, their capture of markers of esteem to show how excellent and how great they are. And this blinding any kind of focus in terms of issues of health, welfare, well-being, which seems entirely counterintuitive and counterproductive to an, an efficient and uh, effective ac uh, academy. Then coming back, this is set against this, 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 the promise. Is it? Uh, and, and this is a very polarized discourse. There are those that are that are advocating for the role of ed tech and how ed tech can support universities in the context of, the, of what we now know as the fourth industrial revolution in terms of digital economy, digital society. But what is this? Is it a promise or is there a threat of ed tech, especially when we see increasing public uh, public private partnerships, the role of things like online public management systems, uh, the increased role of uh, uh, major corporations, uh, global corporations, the Microsofts, the Googles as potential competitors. Uh, and what further does this mean in the context of how we rationalize and practice what we do as academics in the context of a platformized future? Uh, what are the technoethics of, of, uh, involved here when we think about how we are increasingly data in, engaging with processes of datification, uh, unbundling, assetization, et cetera, et cetera? And finally, uh, the, the links into all this sense of precarity is, is, is the monopolization of, of universities in terms of the higher education value chain, is it weakening? Um, and are we seeing a great reset or, 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 or a replacement? So in total, do we need to look through from this experience of the pandemic uh, at a new potential value proposition for higher education? A couple of other final points that I think are really pertinent to this is, and this comes strongly through from the discussion of the data in all the different country contexts, is this question of leadership. Do we need a different kind of leadership? And there are many higher education support organizations that are taking a really interested look at this in terms of what kind of leadership do we need for our universities in the context of post-COVID recovery, for sure, but also in the context of universities' embrace of an in, uh, the digital future and the digital now, if we're completely honest. So what chance is there for what's sometimes referred to as more authentic or values-based leadership? Leadership where values of compassion, empathy are centered. Um, leadership that's willing to stand up to a, the hostility of the current policy environment. 
Leadership also crucially that's digital, digitally literate. And there's huge amount of evidence at the moment which shows that so much of the higher education sector, and this is an international, uh, it varies internationally, uh, but it is an international concern that senior leaders internationally just aren't tuned up in terms of, of, of what the uh, affordances of digital uh, technologies are, how they should be used, how they should be wielded. Some of that's changing, uh, but there's still a significant concern with regards to that. Uh, and to what extent are, we, are they? Are there, do we have leaders that are willing to embrace, crucially, the affordances of digitalization? Uh, not, in, not so much in a gung-ho way, but in a techno-ethical, in, in, in a responsible way. Uh, and finally, you know, if we've had so much of a move towards through this kind of period of crisis management, how can we reclaim, uh, and it's not just the, the period of crisis management, but, but how, given the, how much uh, the problem of leadership that we've got that's been brought into sharp relief, how much can we get more towards consultative shared, even collective leadership? Clearly, one of the things also that's that's thrown up by this is the challenge of the, the of the digital divide, especially as occurs between North and South higher education contexts, and the the challenge of in of places like South Africa is a particularly acute in terms of how we actually utilize technology in terms of the operationalizability of higher education. Finally, I just wanted to mention because this is a piece of work that is ongoing; it necessarily has to be. Uh, and this is a an ongoing project that has brought together, we're calling it Voices of Pandemia, uh, which is talking about the experience of long COVID. Long COVID understood both from a clinical perspective, but also long COVID understood through the experience of the ongoing pandemic. And one only needs to look at, uh, the con the, at how COVID is ongoing, certainly in the context of places like the United States, where we're continuously seeing surges across campuses again, and um, a sense that the virus just won't go into an abeyance. So what are these voices and where are they from? So this project draws together um, from nine different country contexts across the global north, the global south, uh, uh, from Europe, North America, Australasia, to begin to really understand bottom-up accounts of how uh, academics are experiencing this. Again, taking a whole community approach uh, to understanding this, so uh, understanding perspectives of pandemia from uh, higher education leaders, from early career researchers, from doctoral researchers, from academics of colour, from uh, female and male academics, from a, from the whole slew, if you like, of different kind of uh, uh, social categorize, uh, characteristics and variables to begin to understand both internationally, but also taking a whole community approach to understanding what pandemia is and its ongoing experience and its impacts. Uh, and that's being generated and being turned into what will be an open access book, which we hope to see published at the end of the year. And involves a truly international team, much as the focus and necessarily so uh, is international, so too do we have a, a number of international uh, country colleagues from Australia, US, Canada, New Zealand, Ghana, South Africa, and the like who are contributing to this ongoing work. And there I shall stop, take breath and pause and invite your questions. Thank you so much. And thank you, Richard. And it's time now, I think, everyone to put your questions forward into the chat so I can select you into the discussion. Richard, I might start. I've got a couple of questions. Um, very impressive uh, international team there, by the way. That's great to see uh, that level of cooperation. And I think this is one of the things which has been such a strong feature of higher education in the last three decades, the growth of these big international cooperative research efforts using the internet as a medium of continuous discussion. I think in a lot, in a lot of ways, we'll look back on the 1990 to 2020 period as a golden age in higher education, mm -hmm. um, you know, a period where uh, tremendous growth uh, in, the, in participation, tremendous growth in research and scholarship, um, and, uh, and, and, you know, more generally in the role of, of higher education institutions within their societies all over the world. A feature of state building in almost every country except the very poorest has been the growth of higher education. And we've had a lot of freedom to operate, especially across borders, um, which we, under some circumstances historically we would not have had uh, and which we may not have in future. Um, and I, you know, I think we'll, 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 we'll learn to, to, uh, to, to value the time once it uh, ceases to be as, as, as positive as it has been in the last 30 years, despite the managerialism, despite mm -hmm. neoliberalism, yeah. all the performativity, we've still had a lot of room to move and a lot of room to grow. Um, 
it, it, now I'm going to ask you the impossible question. Looking, <laughs> the sociologist, you know, sensible ones would not try to answer normally. Um, Ten years time, look back, you say, okay, um, higher education has changed or changing a lot, um, but there are some changes we can attribute to this period of the pandemic and the shock of the pandemic and the shifts and changes that occurred during the pandemic height period, you know, the period of 20 to 20 to 2022. What do you think those changes would be? Hmm. Uh, well, rather depressingly, Simon, I suspect the changes, if there are going to be any, are going to be incredibly slow and incremental, um, as I think tends to typify higher education generally. So whilst we're very good at adapting, I'm always slightly wary, and it's kind of ironic that we've got a centre that, that talks to higher education transformation, because uh, that is such a big word. Yes. Um, and I, I I rather suspect whatever changes we see will be incremental, uh, will be slow. I think there's there's a lot of the kind of dystopian discourse at the moment, um, and especially that comes through from the ed tech sector, who really benefited uh, from the pandemic in terms of being able to claim that uh, and point to all the deficiencies of what we do within universities and claim that they are the panacea, uh, that their products alter the ultimate alternative to what universities can never possibly do, which I think is hogwash, frankly. Um, but I think it, it is interesting in terms of the extent to which the pandemic has revealed some of the, glaringly revealed some of the internal difficulties within universities, mm. the extent to which health and well-being is, 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 mm. does seem to be massively sidelined. And it, despite mm. a lot of uh, investment and all sorts of initiatives into uh, really emphasising this, it, it's still not really being listened to, it seems. And I think the experience of the pandemic, or rather, are all these respondents' res experiences of their institutions' response to the pandemic reveals how far we need to go in terms of thinking through this change but this change is going to be really hard if we if we are going to take more of a kind of human-centric approach to higher education leadership to the leadership of our universities if we really are going to grasp the opportunity here of, of taking the mantle of compassionate and empathetic leadership then we really need to have a serious uh, discussion about the way with which we place value within the academy uh, where so much of what we seem to be seem to do, as I think was has been again re-emphasized by the release of the ref results just the other day, seems to be on the acquisition of these positional goods, right? Um, and the claim that go the acclaim that goes with them. And it's interesting going on your earlier point, Simon, in terms of the extent to which we can actually collaborate, uh, the extent to which we uh, are and have been able to practice collegiality, the extent to which we've been able to reach out. Actually, the, the most amazing thing, I think, is the is, of the affordances of digital te technology during this time is, is the extent to which we are now working on really globally, but efficiently. Um, and the opportunity for international work on, of this kind is, is just extraordinary. But glaring into the uh, through a, a murky crystal ball in, in terms of uh, where I might be looking back in, in 10 years time from now, I suspect what we will see uh, is incremental change in terms of digitalization and the use of digital technology. Now, I, I think the pandemic has accelerated that. I don't think it's the cause of it, but it's certainly accelerated that. And I think there is a sense talking to academics all over the world and not only academics, but professional service staff, that there, there can be no reset to pre-pandemic times. Actually, this has been something of a threshold moment. Why? Because I think in some respects we've achieved precedent in terms of the application of these technologies. We've become more accustomed to them. We've identified the, the, the usability and the utility value of them for many of the reasons I've already explained. So I think we will see change. I suspect some of the change that's going to be brought about by the pandemic uh, because of the, unless we've got significant government change in places like Australia, well, which, is, which obviously has happened, uh, and the UK, but a change in terms of a policy relationship with higher education. And I wonder how, in the UK, how, how much that's going to happen, frankly, that I wonder whether the status quo might yet prevail. Um, so I see there being increased use and incremental use of digital technologies, and that being reshaping campuses, reshaping the university experience, reshaping the way we do our work. Um, I think the fact that here we are today on an online seminar, it demonstrates the, the reach and the, the ability to commune uh, in ways that we, we never previously would have thought. So there's definite game changes. But, I, but sadly, I think 
uh, the provocations that much of, the, of what's produced by the pandemic will not change until we get a real rethink about what the value and purpose of higher education is, and certainly a rethink in terms of its leadership. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. But the um, the thing that's really struck me about the um, potential of digital technology to, you know, to substitute for the the old paradigm of face to face classes, is that. I mean, the, the possibility has certainly been posed in a kind of direct way, in experiential way through the pandemic period, but also the pushback against that notion and the reassertion of the value of the face-to-face -face experience and the strong desire for sociability amongst students, between students and between students and academic staff, very apparent, a really a strong, I think a really strong um, vindication and uh, statement about the traditional model. Um, so I suspect what we have here is a situation where it will bifurcate so that in situations where institution-based higher education is well established, and we're talking about you know North America, Western Europe, East Asia, uh, and other parts of the world. I mean, Latin America is certainly the case in much of the, the continent. Uh, in those situations, the traditional model of institution-based face-to-face learning will not be fundamentally overturned by the pandemic period. In fact, it may be stronger and may have a longer lease of life because it's those who sought to reform higher education in this way to open it up as a business sector through online learning, replacing institutions and all that valuable real inner city real estate being sold off and all yeah. of that stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that, that, that sort of capitalization won't happen because the buyers will resist. Uh, but in those countries where institution-based face-to-face teaching and learning is not so well established, is not as strong, or is of, uh, or the mass, at the mass level is of low quality, um, India's vulnerable, for example, or in sub-Saharan Africa where level of participation is still relatively low and only now uh, are states moving to build higher education rapidly from a low base and where they don't really have the money all the desire to establish this infrastructure of institutional based face to face teaching and learning there online rather than institutions is likely i think to get a tremendous hold and india is already indicating that through its 2020 policy it wants to massify indian higher education through online learning despite the the lack of infrastructure to support that in the countryside so i think we might see a bifurcation with with possibly the pandemic period being an accelerator of you know the online rather than the face-to-face -face institutions in some parts of the world so i think that's got lots of problems uh, as a final outcome i think um, if i can just if i can add to, add to that Simon, i think what's mm. really interesting as well in terms of seeing the uh, the application of, of, of ed tech especially it, it does strike me you know there's resilience there in terms of undergraduate education and face-to-face -face and, and all, the, all the rest of it and i see that i think what will be really interesting to monitor is the the kind of potential emerging markets for for universities in the context of continuous if there's a greater emphasis now in terms of universities role as providers of continuous lifelong type learning and the the whole kind of micro-credential space as being one clear market opportunity for increased revenue that's going to be an interesting one to follow um, and we're already seeing in places like the US, obviously, numbers of MBAs that are now going far in excess of online than they are in, in terms of uh, in-person on-campus experiences. So I think I think, I think there's a significant amount of segmentation there in terms of uh, where the, the opportunities for uh, uh, digital education are. Yes. And I suspect there's also something there in terms of only the universities that really want to do it will mm -hmm. do it. But because actually the mod, the model remains robust. Mm. Let me bring some people in. Um, I'm glad everyone's now coming forward, but we don't have much time left. So I think the best thing I can do is have multiple questions for you, Richard. Sure. Uh, and I'm going to, I, have, I apologize to those who've posted in the chat. I haven't been able to warn you, um, but let me uh, suggest that we now bring in Sarah Honeybone. Piers von Berg and Jane Carubo in that order. And I'm going to ask you each to come in give and give Richard your question and ask Richard to answer all three questions simultaneously. That might take us to the end of the webinar. If not, we'll have another couple. Um, so first, Sarah, Sarah Honeybone, are you there? I am, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. 
Excellent. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Richard. That's really, really valuable work and a great presentation. Um, I have two questions for you. Why do you think there was a majority of female respondents, um, especially among the academics, obviously professional services, majority female anyway, yeah. but do you yeah. think perhaps because females were more affected, they were more likely, they had more to say, basically. Um, any insights there would be great. Next question is um, regarding the sort of next steps for this sort of research. Do you plan to extend into what we're hearing is happening now, where researchers who had to pivot or stop their research are struggling to get back into their research careers. Um, and so there's this sense that there will be this cohort that will always be mm. two years behind their peers. Uh, we're picking that up a bit in the UK sector, but we've not yet heard of any practical solutions. So I was just wondering if you had any insights on that or any plans to um, extend this research into that now. Yeah, thanks, Jane. Sorry. Richard, hold that thought. That's two questions from Sarah. Um, now, can we bring in Piers, Piers von Berg. Thank you very much for your presentation, Richard. Because of the shortness of time, I'll just simplify the question. Um, should we all be joining a union and taking a very active part in organized labor to address this theme of fracturing? Or have the unions not played a, a significant role in trying to address uh, the theme of fracturing that you mentioned? Thank you very much. Hold that thought too, Richard. and. Jane Carubo, are you there, Jane? Yes, Simon, I'm here. I just uh, want to thank Richard for the good presentation. Uh, I would like him to comment uh, about academic integrity. Uh, the experience we had here during the pandemic was uh, compromising of uh, uh, integrity in, in terms of ethics, uh, students copying uh, their assignments and things like that. Briefly, if you can. Okay, Richard, over to you. Thanks, Simon. So, Sarah, uh, to you first of all. Yeah, it, it was. It's so interesting. Uh, the majority of female respondents, certainly amongst the the academics, as you rightly point out, of course, you'd, you'd accept, you'd expect um, that kind of sample bias in the context of surveying professional service staff because they're, they're just because of the the, the gender uh, uh, demographics there, but. Yes, why? I don't know. I, I don't know that I've got a clear response. So it's it's at best it's a punt. Um, and I think you 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 might have already hit the nail on the head. Is is this in part a self-selecting um, sample? I think what we found certainly in many of the open text questions and comments that people left us was was actually a, a sense of gratitude. Um, and I, I should tell you that we were slightly we were very wary initially to survey because we felt God is this appropriate? Is this ethically right to actually be surveying people at a time of such severe disruption? Um, and it was something we really wrestled with, but actually we, 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 we got, drew great comfort from the number of people, both academic survey respondents, but also uh, especially amongst professional service staff who said, thank you, you provided us a platform from which we could really talk about our experiences. And this has been massively therapeutic and it feels like there's a community of people out there that are listening. Um, so sorry, not a conclusive answer there, but, but best, best to kind of guess as to why. Next steps, absolutely. Um, in fact, the, the, we just finished off um, the last uh, piece of work where we've looked at the kind of longitude and um, we uh, at the professional service staff and said, look, there is real need here for kind of longitudinal uh, analysis of this that now begins to capture and understand we're not post pandemic. And of course there's, there's variations to which people may claim post pandemic in different international contexts. But, but if we are to be somewhere towards a post pandemic or if we're in that mode of post pandemic recovery, what is this missing generation that people are talking about? What is the impact of this? How can we begin to think through all the various impacts of the things that I've been addressing through this research in terms of increased precarization, lost job opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. So there's great need for which now to track and to map this. Also crucially, I, I think, and what we're trying to do with the, with the Voices of Pandemia book is to have something which is much more explicitly qualitative. So we do deep dives into these experiences. Peers, should we be joining a union? And um, what's the role of unions? I think in the UK, um, my personal take at the moment is that it's it's got a, it's got awkward. We we've um, you know we've we've had historic uh, industrial action in UK universities over the course of, of the last few years, and and as preceding the pandemic, and I I sense a huge amount of fatigue and frustration amongst uh, university staff and not just academics, pro-services staff, academics, and of course students in terms of 
How do we do this? And I think it's a really important question in terms of what is the role of the union in terms of uh, mediating this issue of fracture? Um, uh, and if it's something about membership and collective, uh, forming a collective body, is the union the only place with which we do that? I think what's interesting through the experience of the pandemic is actually we, we've seen these, uh, and you, you know, used, utilizing that notion of Ubuntu, uh, I think it's extraordinary. We've found these spaces with which to practice uh, and collectivize, to, to, uh, to practice collegiality, to collectivize. Uh, and these are a peripheral spaces as often tends to be the case and I think there's also very much a role for the use of technology in that so is it just the union I think I think no we need to go much further beyond uh, uh, these kind of formal structures and embrace some of the non-formal structures Jane uh, integrity uh, yes it's a problem and of course this 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 becomes apparent especially apparent when you look at the kind of techno ethics um, side of things in terms of increased use of technology especially in reference to assessment um, and, and, and I think more, just more generally, where we work and live in more intense, work intensified, more precarious uh, uh, cultures where we've already had for, for a long time now a massive focus on hyper performativity, uh, high performance, rather high performance cultures, we've got audit culture, we've got competitive accountability, then we've got this culture of gaming. Uh, which is all too apparent. And yes, there are huge question marks there in terms of how that can impact the, the ethics of what we do. So big questions for me in terms of how the pandemic has, has, has further these stresses and strains and perhaps further challenged and jeopardized uh, uh, academic integrity. Well, well, thanks very much, Richard. I mean, we, clearly we needed an hour and a half or two hours today um, <laughs> to, to, good, to do full justice to your to remarkably interesting data. And um, a lot of people coming in uh, late in the in the chat um, who unable to who've been unable to get on. Celia Whitchurch, Zara Bennett, Marta uh, Kozlowska, Alexia Reno, uh, Edmund Adam. I apologise to you. It would have been nice to, for you to dialogue directly with Richard uh, and maybe there'll be another chance to talk to you about this research again Richard I mean you're certainly most welcome to present Thank again on, on this topic uh, as you as your work develops we're particularly interested in the comparative experience you know of UK and the other countries I think um, you know it's it's it, similarities and differences of course as you know across the world make very interesting discussion in relation to the pandemic colleagues some um, Next webinar is next uh, Tuesday, the 14th of June. Year is rushing to the mid midpoint. And we have um, British National Overseas Citizenship Holders and UK Higher Education. This is about Hong Kong and the UK and Hong Kong, China and the UK. And we have a cast of thousands. Michael Nat uh, Natsler, Kaho Mok, who will be well known to many, uh, Tommy Chan, Corinne Squire and Sunda Katwala five speakers in an hour so we'll see how that goes but you have to ask yourself with five speakers um you know on this list if you're not on this list where's your career going you know you, obviously uh, uh, you know it's this is this is this is a very large group indeed um so look forward to that and look forward to seeing you again richard and and sincere thanks for to, to such a good webinar today bye for Thank now you, Simon.